is my pleasure and honor to introduce once again uh, a good friend and uh, easily the best reviewed speaker in any of the sessions that we have, Professor Keith Whittington of Princeton University. He's the William Nelson Cromwell Professor of Politics, and he teaches on American constitutional law, politics and history, and American political thought. He was uh, trained as an undergraduate, I believe, at the University of Texas, completed his PhD at Yale. And the book that Ryan and I were talking about and speaking uh, uh, so favorably about is a book called Speak Freely, Why Universities Must Defend Free Speech. And it is a great book also for people who are trying to apply these lessons to schools as well. Uh, Keith has the uh, the remarkable ability to take very complicated theory about about politics and then jurisprudential uh, literature and distill it in a way that it's very understandable and then apply it to cases and apply all of that to real life situations and and have it make sense and be very clear. And it's a very, very brief and very digestible and very interesting book. I highly recommend it. He's also uh, very well known for a classic volume, Constitutional Interpretation, Textual Meaning, Original Intent, and Judicial Review. What I wanted to stress for Professor Whittington, who um, is is one of the people who I, whenever whenever I have a chance to read anything by him or to uh, listen to any of his talks, I take that opportunity because I learn from him. And it's always helpful as a scholar in the field to learn from other scholars. Uh, Professor Whittington is what would call a, a public scholar. You will read him on Twitter. You will see him writing opinion pieces. You will see him debating issues in different fora. Uh, he has helped to launch the Academic Freedom Alliance, which defends college and university personnel and teachers who uh, find themselves in jeopardy for their jobs and their freedom and losing their freedom of speech and academic freedom. And I'm also delighted to uh, to note again that he is, I think, the only uh, non-lawyer and the only political science professor who was on President's, by President Biden's Presidential Commission on the Supreme Court of the United States, studying and recommending possible changes to that body. Uh, Professor Whittington, it is a pleasure to see you. Thank you so much for taking time out of your very busy schedule to talk to our group. Well, thank you very much. I uh, appreciate that uh, very generous uh, introduction. Um, so uh, I was going to uh, share a PowerPoint um, uh, with you so that we um, have something to uh, look at besides me um, as we are um, cruising through this stuff. Um, and uh, let's see if I can get this successfully going. Um, and so uh, if you've got questions that come up um, since since now I can't actually see you all in particular, uh, you got questions that come up during um, uh, as we go over it, uh, don't hesitate to stick them in the chat. Um, uh, I'm happy to pause and um, uh, deal with something that has come up most immediately, um, as well as um, there'll be lots of time um, at the end um, to talk about uh, anything that might have struck your fancy um, as we go through it. So uh, broadly speaking, uh, there's a little Justice Alito, um, some Roberts Court in general, the First Amendment, um, and uh, some discussion about originalism and living constitutionalism. So we'll start off with the sort of bigger theory issues um, and some historical flavor um, in thinking about how to think about the Constitution, which is uh, relevant to the Roberts Court um, in general, although, um, uh, as I'll say, not necessarily crucial um, in the specific context of the First Amendment. We'll talk some about the First Amendment broadly um, and then uh, focus some more specifically on some of the uh, recent decisions uh, the Roberts Court um, has engaged in, uh, which may also set us up a little bit to think about um, uh, controversies uh, relating to the First Amendment free speech in particular um, that will um, uh, be coming to the Roberts Court um, uh, before too long. Um, so it's worth starting, I think, just thinking about the constitutional text and how the constitutional text um, is uh, written. Um, and here I just want to make sort of two uh, basic uh, distinctions between sort of uh, some text um, in the Constitution is uh, very specific um, in what it's trying to do. It lays down uh, fairly concrete rules. Um, sometimes that can all still generate 
um, uh, controversies about how those rules apply um, in particular situations. It may still be the case that there's some ambiguity and uncertainty about the meaning of those rules. Um, but it's often the broader features of the Constitution, the broader language that gets used in the Constitution that generates a lot more uh, constitutional controversy um, over time. And this is true, both the sort of uh, specific and broad kind of text um, you see it both in the uh, structural features of the Constitution, um, as well as uh, the rights-oriented features of the Constitution that we'll particularly focus on um, in thinking about the First Amendment. So I give you a couple examples here of text that's quite specific um, about what it's trying uh, to do. It lays down very specific rules, um, not a lot of wiggle room about um, uh, our uncertainty um, about what uh, this kind of text uh, might mean. Um, but as I know it, even in the structural context, you can get some pretty broad uh, language um, as well. Um, and so these are uh, provisions um, from the original Constitution 1787 before you get the Bill of Rights um, added. And you can see the language here um, is empowering of Congress and setting up structures um, and features um, of the organization of the new government under the Constitution. Uh, but the language is often pretty sweeping and broad. And so it introduces um, in these contexts than lots of um, interpretive difficulties um, in trying to make sense um, of what this language might actually mean in practice. Um, and notably among this particular list, the first three of them um, have been uh, used quite often um, over the course of American history as being uh, places of argumentation um, and disagreement about how we ought to think about them. Um, the first two subject to quite a bit of um, interpretation by the US Supreme Court um, over time, trying to clarify what kind of powers Congress um, has. The third being often used by the executive branch and its own uh, legal argumentation about what kind of uh, power um, the executive branch thinks it has um, itself, or more particularly that the president um, has um, uh, in the system of government. And then the fourth um, uh, about United States shall guarantee to every state in this union or a Republican form of government is another example of this very broad uh, kind of empowering language um, the original constitution used. Um, but in this case is one that has not given rise to a lot of interpretive uh, controversy over time. Instead, it's mostly been ignored. Uh, which is another thing that can happen, I think, when you have uh, quite broad constitutional text in which it's not entirely clear what it might mean. Um, uh, in this case, it provides a kind of guarantee um, about the nature of the state, but precisely because the nature of that guarantee is not terribly clear, um, it's been something uh, that um, has mostly just sat on the sidelines uh, rather than be something that's given a lot of substantive content and becomes part of a controversy over time. We might think that's partially just a feature of the fact uh, that we've been fairly fortunate to, in fact, have Republican governments um, uh, across American history. So maybe we just haven't needed um, this provision very much. Um, but on the other hand, if you think there's some real teeth uh, to uh, this provision, then maybe you think it's been uh, sitting on the sidelines too much um, and should have been uh, utilized uh, more um, across American history. So you get both these sort of specific provisions and sort of much broader provisions um, in the in empowering organizational features of the Constitution. And of course, you also see this um, in uh, the rights provisions um, of the Constitution um, as well. Um, uh, there are some rights provisions, of course, in the original Constitution of 1787, uh, but we particularly think about the rights provisions that are contained in subsequent amendments um, to the Constitution, both the Bill of Rights, uh, but also um, other amendments like the 14th Amendment, uh, which is where the second uh, quote is drawn from. And so the real interpretive challenges to think about sort what does it mean to say uh, Congress shall make no law abridging the freedom of speech? We might think that's fairly straightforward as to what it means to say Congress shall make no law, but abridging the freedom of speech uh, just seems, um, uh, and I noticed I left out the of in freedom of speech, but, uh, but um, <laughs> limiting the freedom of speech um, just seems intrinsically uh, not obvious um, what exactly uh, they have um, in mind. And as you might expect, then gives rise to lots of interpretive challenges um, as to try to think about how we ought to uh, implement this um, in the face of various controversies that arise um, in the future, which gives rise to then potential debates about interpretive theory. How do we go about interpreting a text like the Constitution um, and the kind of com uh, commitments the Constitution makes um, uh, in general? Um, Debates about interpretive theory as such, um, how we go about interpreting a constitutional text, um, are really an century for the, for the most part. Um, there were not the same kind of self-conscious uh, debates about um, how you go about interpreting 
um, a constitution um, in the 19th century um, uh, in general. So we don't see something that looks quite equivalent to the kind of debates that occupy a lot more attention um, in the 20th century. There is um, uh, what instead you see um, uh, emphasized more um, in the 19th century, especially the early part of the 19th century, is a concern about yes. distinguishing between um, strict and loose construction of the interpretation, uh, with Jeffersonians particularly advocating for a kind of strict interpretation um, of the Constitution, which they understood as uh, an interpretation that will limit uh, federal power in particular, so we shouldn't read these empowering clauses um, of the Constitution of the type that we just saw a while ago um, as being too expansive uh, because it undermines the federal system in general, as they understand it, as opposed to uh, the Federalist or uh, Supreme Court justice like John Marshall, um, who uh, reject that kind of reading and think we ought to read these things uh, more broadly. That's a, that has a relationship, at least, to thinking about it as an interpretive theory, um, but it's not a sweeping interpretive theory that sort of tells you how to think about all the parts of the constitutional text, how we ought to be interpreting it more generally. Instead, they're specifically concerned with some parts of the constitutional text, and they have much more substantive content that we tend to think of interpretive theories uh, more generally having. Nonetheless, you see um, some kinds of claims being made um, uh, relatively early on in American history that at least um, uh, foreshadow uh, the kinds of interpretive uh, debates uh, that we wind up um, getting much more explicitly um, in the 20th century uh, context. And so some of these kinds of arguments um, are sort of what we might think of as, as proto-originalist kinds of arguments. They're not as self-conscious um, as modern originalist arguments are. They're not necessarily framed in that sense, in part because they don't have a very clear sense of there being an alternative um, to originalism um, per se. Um, they're certainly not as uh, methodologically concerned as uh, modern debates of originalism uh, might be. But you see sort of the same kind of instinct um, that arises in uh, later originalist theorizing that appears quite early on in debates about how to think about and interpret the Constitution. So this is um, from Thomas Jefferson, uh, a letter that he wrote to a frequent correspondent near the end of his life, but it's reflective of uh, quite a few things that not only Jefferson said, but the Jeffersonians more generally uh, said um, about how to think about the Constitution. Um, and the interesting component that I would call your attention to is particularly um, this sort of uh, first part where he emphasizes on every question of construction, carry ourselves back to the time when the Constitution was adopted, recollect the spirit manifested in those uh, debates. Um, the, the goal ought to be in thinking about how to uh, clarify the constitutional text, that we ought to be trying to read it um, in the spirit of those who are adopting it in the first place. Um, for Jefferson, and then that's true in this particular quote as well, in the letter he's writing um, in this context, that's partially tied up in a particular argument about states' rights. And so uh, the Jeffersonians were advocates of what uh, became known as a compact theory of the origins of the Constitution and the federal constitutional system uh, more generally. So uh, this kind of argument was also particularly tied to the idea um, that the states were the authors of the Constitution. They empowered the creation of the Constitution more generally. And so you had particularly to respect the bargain that the states made among themselves um, in later interpreters and not um, undermine that. Um, so that's a kind of concern that tends to drop out um, of later constitutional theorizing. Um, but the general concern of saying, okay, well, look, we ought to try to recapture uh, what the people who uh, entered into this bargain in the first place uh, meant uh, to be doing um, certainly uh, reflects this kind of originalist uh, spirit. Um, and, and in that case, sort of as it ties in particular to a concern about um, we have to be faithful to those who were striking a deal um, at the time that they were making the Constitution. Justice Joseph Story, who is um, also a Jeffersonian, he was appointed to the court um, uh, by uh, the Jeffersonian administrations, but James Madison, uh, in this case, but becomes a close ally of uh, Chief Justice John Marshall um, on the early days of the court, um, is an extremely influential uh, figure um, at the time, uh, both as a justice, but also um, as an author um, and as a Harvard Law School professor. Um, uh, and his commentaries of the Constitution uh, is one of the most extensive early um, efforts to expound the meaning of the Constitution sort of after the Federalist Papers uh, in uh, particular. And uh, Story gave some attention to these kinds of interpretive debates, and particularly these disagreements between the Jeffersonians um, and uh, John Marshall, uh, in particular in thinking about how to um, understand uh, the Constitution. 
Um, and you see that story in this uh, characterization of how we ought to go about the process of trying to understand the Constitution um, emphasizes a kind of textualism, although it's a textualism that's resonant, um, uh, again, with sort of originalist uh, kinds of concerns, although the story had some real disagreements with Jefferson, for example, about how to think about uh, construing the Constitution more generally. But as he emphasizes, we should be understanding the Constitution as it's expounded in its plain, obvious, and common sense. Um, uh, that we shouldn't try to read things into the Constitution, which is also something Jefferson was very concerned about. Uh, but instead, we ought to understand the Constitution as something uh, that ordinary people are capable of understanding. Um, and uh, the people were the ones who adopted the Constitution in the first place, and they were the ones who breathed life into it um, as a governing document. Um, and so the kinds of interpretations of that document that later judges put into it um, ought to be something that is sensible to the kind of people uh, that were adopting uh, the Constitution uh, in the first place. Um, notably, there's not quite the same kind of historical emphasis um, in this particular language from story. So he sort of emphasizes um, uh, we ought to have a common sense reading that the people can understand um, about the Constitution, whereas Jefferson's very concerned to say, uh, writing a decade earlier in the story in this case, <laughs> Jefferson's particularly concerned with saying, no, no, we ought to not only just read the text in the way that people uh, generally can understand, but we ought to be reading the text in a way specifically that those who were drafting the text um, understood. And that's something that story, that story tend to not emphasize in quite the same way uh, that Jefferson did. Likewise, you see this sort of kind of argument still trickling all through the later part of the 19th century. Thomas Cooley um, was also an extraordinarily influential uh, figure um, in his case in the latter part of the 19th century. Um, he was the chief justice of the Michigan State Supreme Court um, uh, for quite a few years, an extremely influential uh, treatise writer, just like uh, Joseph Story was um, in the first part um, of the 19th century. Um, and Cooley, um, likewise, uh, was an influential um, uh, character in uh, uh, creating law schools in the United States, in his case, by being dean um, of the University of Michigan. Um, uh, law school. And his treatise on constitutional limitations, one of his uh, more important works um, that he was writing just at the tail end um, of the war and during the Reconstruction period, um, in general concerned with emphasizing uh, the restrictions on government power um, in, in general, um, and in, the, and in emphasizing that element, the ways in which the Constitution limits the powers of uh, government officials to do the things they want, um, he's likewise particularly concerned with, well, what's the interpretive method? How should we as judges approach the task of trying to make sense of constitutions and try to enter into constitutional controversies, while bearing in mind the whole point of a constitution is to try to tie the hands um, of those um, who are wielding uh, government power. And so his particular concern is, look, we've got to uh, make sure that then this reading of the Constitution is going to be stable over time, that we're trying to recur back um, to what the words um, had always meant, because if we don't do that, um, we're just inviting government officials to be constantly expanding their powers. And he thinks the implication of that's going to be uh, that the rights of the American people are going to be uh, shrinking um, in response as the um, government is expanding its own authority. So you have a different kind of rationale as to why we ought to be thinking about uh, the constitutional text in this particular way. Uh, but again, this sort of appeal is very similar to say, we need to tie our hands back to how people were thinking about the constitutional meaning, um, because if we don't do that, um, uh, we're not going to stick to uh, the constitutional commitments um, uh, that we're supposed to be sticking to. This all gets challenged, in particular in the early 20th century, begins to be challenged a little bit in the late uh, 19th century, in which you really, for the first time, get a serious conflict between different kinds of visions about how you go about interpreting the Constitution, and even what the very nature of a constitutional uh, project and constitutional government um, is more broadly. Um, and it's this challenge from sort of a living constitutionalist approach to thinking about the Constitution that sort of forces scholars later um, and jurists and others to um, develop more self-consciously an alternative to the living constitutionalism, uh, which builds on the kinds of things Thomas Cooley was doing uh, in order to uh, create something that looks like modern uh, originalist theory. Um, and so the living constitutionalism is being advocated by a number of quite influential people um, uh, in the late 19th and early uh, 20th century. Woodrow Wilson was among them. Woodrow Wilson was um, a very influential um, political science scholar um, uh, when uh, he was on faculty at Princeton University before he became um, uh, actually quite influential educational reformer as president um, of Princeton University and of course then uh, eventually goes on to a political career 
um, as well. But it's in that scholarly part of his life, and particularly sort of laying out this vision about how constitutions work in general, and what are the implications for how we ought to be thinking about constitutions, um, that really is putting in place the building blocks for thinking about constitutions um, as uh, living entities, not something uh, that are stable and fixed over time, the way Thomas Cooley would have emphasized, um, but instead something that's constantly uh, mutating, constantly changing and adapting um, in order to um, change and adapt with American society uh, more generally. So you see sort of this sharp contrast between what Wilson says um, here, for example, in uh, one of his books, Constitutional Government in the United States, um, and the kind of contrast with what he, how he thinks about the Constitution compared to how Thomas Cooley was thinking about the Constitution just a few decades earlier, where Cooley is very concerned with how do we stabilize this thing um, so it doesn't adapt um, and change, because if it's adapting and changing, uh, that means government officials are no longer being tied down uh, by the bonds of the Constitution, whereas Wilson, on the other hand, is saying, no, no, uh, you don't want a Constitution that ties you down. You want a Constitution that empowers you uh, to be able to go off and do uh, good and important things um, and serve the public uh, more generally. So as he wants to characterize at the very end of this quote, um, the written document would become too stiff a garment for a living thing. Um, if you didn't interpret it in this kind of fashion. Um, so think about this nation society as growing and adapting and evolving over time. And likewise, the constitution has to grow and adapt and evolve uh, alongside it. Um, it's picked up by um, uh, many others, including uh, notably Edward Corwin, who was a, uh, a professor at Princeton University, um, sort of a heir, heir of uh, Wilson as a scholar. Corwin is writing, uh, doing a lot of his scholarly work in the early part of the 20th century, um, becomes a very prominent person, both in terms of thinking about the Constitution and just review, but also thinking ultimately about powers of the presidency uh, more broadly. But you see the same kind of orientation to how you think about the Constitution uh, that comes um, here as it does uh, with people like um, Wilson at the time, uh, where we ought to be thinking of the Constitution as a living statute uh, to be interpreted in light of living conditions. We shouldn't be trying to cast ourselves back, um, as Jefferson would have said, um, to those who were creating the Constitution in the first place and the kind of deal they were striking uh, when they were drafting the Constitution. Um, instead, we should constantly be thinking about well, what would be useful for us right now um, in uh, how um, our constitutional rules ought to be um, oriented. And like, and then we ought to try to interpret the Constitution so it's as compatible as possible uh, with what we think might be useful um, at the moment. And then that brings us then to sort of um, uh, more self-conscious, modern, originalist kinds of arguments in thinking about the Constitution, which is really responding to this kind of living constitutionalist kind of concern, there are echoes of the kinds of things that are being said by some of those uh, jurists in the early part of the 19th century, um, but it's sort of taking on board a new set of arguments and concerns as well and fighting with a particular foe um, in the process. So one of the early um, statements of this comes from uh, Robert Bork, who is then um, a Yale Law School professor, um, later a judge, um, a failed uh, Supreme Court uh, nominee during the Reagan um, uh, presidency. Um, one of Bork's early efforts to try to think about um, constitutional interpretation issues and start laying out this theory of originalism comes in this 1971 article um, on neutral principles, and interestingly enough, on neutral principles and the First Amendment. And we'll come to what he has to say about the First Amendment uh, in a moment, but he lays out this theoretical argument about how we ought to think about interpreting these provisions um, of uh, the Constitution. Um, so in part of Bork's concern in particular is a little different than what we've seen even in all the others um, before. So where Cooley is very concerned about a kind of libertarian vision how do we enforce limitations on the government successfully uh, so the government doesn't encroach on people's liberty? We see Jefferson sort of worried about a kind of states' rights vision. How do we prevent the national government uh, from getting too powerful um, and, and breaking the deal that the states had entered into in the first place? Uh, Bork is much more concerned with how do we stop the judges uh, from being too creative with the Constitution and as a consequence imposing their values um, and their policy solutions on the American people more generally. Um, uh, so interestingly, a lot of these uh, kinds of theoretical debates about how to think about the Constitution are motivated by a particular kind of problem that you are worried about. Um, and which and how you conceptualize what a constitution is supposed to be doing and what are the threats to the constitutional system um, that prevent it from doing that 
Um, and that leads you to particular conclusions about how you want to think about constitutions being interpreted. And so in Bork's case, he's very worried about judges. This is coming in the aftermath of the Warren Court in particular, or is among those who think the Warren Court was off the rails um, in terms of what it was trying to do, couldn't justify what it was doing under the Constitution, was um, advocating for a lot of policies that he thought uh, were misguided. Um, and so for Bork, then, the way of avoiding that kind of thing from happening um, is to force judges uh, to go back and actually try to think about um, what were the value choices um, that were attributable to the founding fathers that really embed in the Constitution in the first place, rather than just thinking about well, what value choices do I think would be great, um, and then try to impose them uh, going uh, forward. And you see William Rehnquist, um, who at this point was Associate Justice in 1976 when he gives the speech on the idea of a living Constitution, uh, later, of course, um, uh, Chief Justice, um, where he's likewise concerned about uh, the worry of the court sort of running away with the Constitution, imposing itself um, on the people uh, more, more generally. Um, but you see also in Rehnquist sort of more of a concern and thinking in particular um, that we need to have sort of a stable set of commitments um, over time. And so one of his concerns about the problem with the kind of living Constitution that people like uh, Wilson and Corwin uh, would have advocated um, is that it's uh, very hard to perceive uh, what kinds of changes and adaptations are really going to be necessary. Rehnquist is worried that we're going to be constantly fluctuating, um, constantly trying to read the tea leaves um, of what would be suitable in our present moment. And so judges would just be constantly modifying the Constitution um, uh, willy-nilly. Uh, instead, Rehnquist wants to say, look, the, the whole point of the Constitution is to stabilize things um, and not to uh, encourage more disruption and chaos. Um, and the only way the Constitution is going to be effective in keeping things uh, stable um, and anchored um, is by trying to recur back to a kind of originalist uh, vision of how you go about interpreting that constitutional text in the first place. Um, interestingly, Rehnquist is a little less committed to um, originalism as such than Robert Bork is. And so he has some stuff he writes that is very originalist in its sensibilities. Um, at other times, he's willing to set it aside in order to focus on other things. Notably, John Roberts, the current chief justice, had been a clerk um, of William Rehnquist, and Roberts, likewise, I think, with Rehnquist, sort of shares this um, uh, partial attraction to originalism. He's willing to make those kinds of arguments sometimes, um, but he's not wedded to it um, in a particularly strong way, unlike people like uh, Rob Bork, who really, um, um, that's their uh, core move. So let's transition then to thinking some about the First Amendment um, uh, in particular, and so it's debates about how we go about interpreting constitutional text. And one of the interesting things about thinking about the First Amendment um, is that um, hardly anyone thinks about the First Amendment in very originalist uh, terms. Um, and we'll see this uh, for a bit. So like I said before, Robert Bork sort of is first laying out his theory about originalism in this 1971 article uh, that's in part about the First Amendment. And so the first half of that article um, is spending a lot of time thinking about originalism, how we ought to go about interpreting constitutional text in the face of this uncertainty about its meanings, how we need to tie the hands of judges in various ways. Um, and then he sort of turns to the second half of the article to thinking specifically about the First Amendment. Um, and then he says things like this. Uh, the First Amendment was hastily drafted document. No one really thought very carefully about what the heck it even meant. Um, and so as a consequence, we're on our own uh, figuring out what the First Amendment might mean. Uh, we shouldn't worry too much about what the founders uh, potentially um, had uh, in mind. Um, so interestingly for Bork, when it comes to the First Amendment, he's a living constitutionalist. Um, uh, and although in a, for a particular kind of reason, to Bork, um, which he also says in other kind of context, part of what Bork's concern is to say, uh, we should be an originalist when we can. Um, but he also thinks, look, there's going to be times when, in fact, it's just unclear what the Constitution means. So unlike Wilson, who thinks the Constitution might be very clear about what we think the historical meaning of it is, but we need to change it in order to make the thing adaptable to our present needs. Um, and unless the Constitution forces us down a particular path, uh, we ought to be willing to go a different direction. Bork, on the other hand, is much more inclined to want to say, no, no, if we can figure out what the Constitution was supposed to mean to those who drafted it, we're, we got to stick with that. Um, but he thinks there's going to be parts of the Constitution um, that may not be so clear, and then we're off doing something else. Um, in some context, Bork sort of famously says, well, if we're off doing something else and the Constitution is not that clear, uh, then really judges should uh, step aside and just let elected uh, politicians uh, do whatever they're going to do. 
because judges don't have the authority to stop them because there's no clear constitutional meaning that judges can point to and say, the Constitution has tied your hands. Um, and here, let me show you how. But the First Amendment, he tends not to think that way. So the First Amendment, he thinks this is one of these spaces where it's not totally clear what the Constitution means, but Bork's not willing to just have judges step aside and say, yeah, whatever you want to do. Instead, it's this one space where he wants to say, judges need to try to think about how to enforce First Amendment values in a context in which the First Amendment is not giving us a lot of guidance. Um, and the kind of dilemma that Bork has a particular orientation of this, the kind of dilemma that he's pointing to um, is one that works over again with conservative uh, jurists more generally, even the ones there's, that are attracted to originalism, including those on the court right now, who are pretty attracted to originalism, broadly speaking, tend not to talk very much in those terms uh, when they're talking about the First Amendment uh, in particular, especially when they're thinking about the free speech clauses, which is what Bork um, has in mind here, less about the religion uh, clauses. Um, so what, how to think about the First Amendment? What, what kind of clues does uh, the original meaning of the uh, uh, Bill of Rights in the First Amendment uh, give us exactly? And why is it maybe not that helpful? So there's the one thing about the um, right of freedom of speech embedded in the First Amendment of the U.S. Constitution um, is this is a standard right that all the state constitutions are recognizing as well. Um, and the state constitutions, they're being drafted during the revolution and in its immediate aftermath, um, all include their own declarations um, of rights. They all include their own sort of overlap and what gets included um, in these kinds um, of Declaration of Rights. Um, and freedom of speech um, is, is one of those. So the Pennsylvania Declaration of Rights, uh, which was drafted um, uh, right at the beginning of the revolution in 1776, is um, consistent with how a lot of these things are written um, in general and how they um, are specific. Notably here, it's a little more fleshed out than what we see, or maybe just a different variation of what we see in the First Amendment to the U.S. Constitution, which is say that people have a right to freedom of speech and of writing and publishing their sentiments. And so we might think the second half of that basically becomes freedom of the press, um, although uh, here the emphasis as well, freedom of the press ought not to be restrained because of this underlying concern of saying people ought to be able to speak their mind. Um, but again, it doesn't give us any more detail about what the freedom of speech is. It just references this thing that's out there. Um, you have a right to freedom of speech, whatever that happens to mean. Um, and a Pennsylvania uh, government ought to uh, respect it. So James Wilson takes a stab um, at explaining uh, what this uh, uh, freedom of speech thing uh, might actually mean. Uh, James Wilson was a very prominent uh, founder. Uh, he's a, participant in the uh, Constitutional Convention in Philadelphia. He was a participant in the ratification debates um, in Pennsylvania. Um, he uh, later became a uh, one of the first Supreme Court justices. Um, uh, he also taught um, in a law school, in his case, the University of Pennsylvania um, uh, Law School. Um, and his lectures are also kind of influential in thinking about sort of legal thinking uh, during the time period. Um, and so Wilson in 1787 offers this as to what uh, we mean uh, by uh, liberty of the press. And what he offers um, is what he understands to be uh, the English rule. Um, that in particular is what can be extrapolated from uh, William Blackstone, who was an English uh, treatise writer um, and law professor as well, um, who summarized how he understood what he understood English law to be at roughly the time of the American Revolution. Many of the founders uh, just take on board what Blackstone said about the English common law and the English legal system um, and assumes that's basically right. And then for many of them, they think, okay, well, in some cases, we've just imported those uh, British uh, uh, legal commitments um, and included them in our constitutional texts. Um, including the liberty of press. And so Wilson says, well, what does Blackstone tell us uh, liberty of press means? And as a consequence, what does liberty of press means when it's included in things like these state constitutions and the federal constitution? Well, he says, all it means is there should be no antecedent restraint um, upon the liberty of the press, which is to say, you can't have censors who license you to be able to say some things and then prevent you from saying something else. 
that's all Liberty Press means for Wilson. No censorship um, in that in that direct sense. Unlike the English system, which at a period of time did in fact um, have a licensing scheme uh, that you had to run your publications by a censor and have them approved before they could be uh, published. Um, Wilson says, well, what we mean by Liberty Press is you don't have to do that anymore. You don't have to ask the government before you put it in print. But the second half of this is quite important for Wilson and for a lot of these early uh, legal arguments about Liberty Press. Every author is responsible uh, when he attacks the security or welfare of the government or the safety character and property of the individual. So the government shouldn't stop you from publishing it before it goes to press, but the government can punish you for abusing that liberty um, after you've circulated it. And so if you can print whatever you want, um, but once you printed it, um, entirely possible you could get sued for it um, or um, otherwise uh, legally penalized for it um, if it um, attacks security welfare of the government or damages um, other individuals uh, in particular way. So that thinks of liberty of press as being a fairly narrow kind of commitment. It, it takes very specific kinds of things off the table, but leaves a lot of potential restrictions uh, still uh, in place. That starts shifting pretty rapidly, though, um, in the early American experience. Um, so Wilson sort of is telling us what we think we uh, know about liberty of press um, uh, at the time of the American founding itself, when we're first starting off as a country. Uh, pretty quickly, though, we find ourselves uh, with uh, uh, political parties forming, electoral competition, serious disagreements about how we ought to run the government um, and the like. Um, and suddenly people like James Madison are starting to think more deeply about what does it mean to have a free government and trying to make a democratic system work uh, among the things that Madison is very concerned about is that the Federalist uh, Congress passes uh, the Sedition Acts of 1798, which is designed precisely to punish people uh, for printing things that are um, overly hostile um, to uh, the Federalist government at the time. Um, and Madison uh, uh, winds up developing out then an argument that says, well, look, if we're serious about freedom of the press um, and freedom of speech in the context of um, a democratic form of government in which we're electing um, uh, politicians to uh, represent us in the future, um, it's not sufficient. Uh, to simply imagine that liberty of press just means no censorship as such. We also need to restrict seriously uh, what kinds of punishments the government can pose on you for the things you have published um, already. Um, and so uh, at the end of this quote, you see in particular, uh, Madison teases it out then what he's thinking is uh, the security of the freedom of press requires that it be ex exempt not only from previous restraint um, by the executive, the British rule, um, as he understands it, and as um, uh, Wilson uh, would have emphasized, um, but it also uh, needs to be free from subsequent penalties of law. Um, so you can't be saying, uh, you can print whatever you want, but if the government doesn't like it, um, as it turns out, uh, we can hang you uh, for it. Madison says, well, that's just as bad as having an actual uh, uh, licensing regime or censorship regime um, as such, and you can't really operate a democratic form of government, and that's what you think liberty of press is. We need something much more expansive um, if we're going to have uh, the kind of political system that we think we have. This argument was extraordinarily influential, um, emerges fairly quickly in American history, but notably emerges after uh, the Constitution um, is uh, drafted and after the Bill of Rights, including the First Amendment, um, is drafted and included. Um, so Madison sort of trying to reconceptualize uh, what we're referring to when we say you have freedom of speech or you have freedom of press, uh, Wilson says, well, the thing we're referring to when we say that is what the British thought it, that meant. And Madison says, no, no, what the British thought that meant and that monarchical government over there, not going to be adequate. And so the thing we're referring to when we talk about freedom of speech or we're talking about freedom of press has to be understood more expansively. Um, and interestingly, right, Madison's making this argument not in the kind of Jeffersonian way, what were people thinking when they drafted the constitution in the first place? He's not emphasizing, this is the deal we cut, this is what everyone thought we meant uh, when we adopted this. Instead, Madison's argument is much like the argument actually Bork winds up making this 1971 article. What Madison's really fundamentally thinking is, look, we've got a system of democratic government. What is the nature of freedom of speech and press that is consistent with that kind of government? So he's trying to think about the relationship between the constitutional guarantees where we have in place and the kind of government that we're trying uh, to successfully establish um, and operate. Um, 
interestingly, right, the things sort of sit there for a long time in terms of how the basic conception of freedom of the press and freedom of speech um, are put in place. Uh, the kind of arguments that Madison is offering are widely adopted um, uh, by Americans, both politicians and judges, um, in thinking about sort of what we mean by this freedom of speech stuff. Um, but it's not very aggressively enforced or implemented by um, courts through much of the 19th century. There are some cases, but not a tremendous number of them. Um, things change in the early part of the 20th century when the U.S. Supreme Court um, becomes much more aggressive in trying to enforce uh, the terms of, of the uh, First Amendment, often through uh, its application to the states via the 14th Amendment. Um, and then the court is uh, embarks on this process of trying to elaborate, okay, what do we actually mean? Uh, when we're talking about the right of free speech um, and uh, freedom of the press. And Whitney versus California is uh, one of the cases in which you get this very important sort of early statement in the first part um, of the 20th century, where you see, in this case, the courts applying the logic of the First Amendment um, to the state governments, um, in this case, California. It does so as the beginning of this quote um, says, uh, by making use of the due process clause of the 14th Amendment, saying uh, something like freedom of speech is protected um, by the 14th Amendment and applied as a federal right um, against the states through the 14th Amendment. And then you have this sort of um, uh, claim about the importance of these rights that also breaks them down a little more. We have a right to free speech, the right to teach, right? Right to teach not mentioned anywhere um, in the Constitution, but it's sort of understood to be an extension of uh, the kind of thing we have in mind uh, by freedom of speech, the right of assembly. These are all fundamental rights, um, uh, the court says, that cannot be denied um, or abridged. Um, but notably, right, while you also want to say they're, of course, fundamental, um, they're not in their nature absolute. So there's going to come with some limitations, qualifications um, uh, to this right. And so it opens the door to saying we should understand these rights expansively, but we also have to understand there should be some limitations on those rights. And then the court winds up being in the business really of trying to tell us, OK, where are those limits going to be? Um, in ways they just weren't thinking about uh, very much uh, in the 19th century as they were thinking about these kind of rights. So if you jump over some stuff, yada, 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 we get to the Roberts Court. Um, so lots of war in court and other exciting things that happen in between, um, but uh, let's jump ahead uh, to where we are now. So strikingly, right, the Roberts Court's already done uh, quite a few cases uh, relating to uh, the free speech clauses of the First Amendment with its applications, both to the federal government and uh, to the states. There are some big themes that are worth emphasizing that I want to tease out some specifics about some particular um, uh, lines of doctrine. One thing to note about the Roberts Court, um, it's a conservative court, uh, of course, um, but it's also a very libertarian court when it comes to uh, free speech. So uh, there was a time not that long ago where if you had said, uh, the Supreme Court is a pretty conservative court, the implication of that would have been uh, they take a pretty conservative approach to thinking about free speech, which means a pretty restrictive approach uh, to thinking about free speech. The, the First Amendment should be understood fairly narrowly, government power pretty expansively uh, relative to First Amendment rights. That's certainly how Rehnquist, uh, for example, uh, thought about the First Amendment. He tended to think First Amendment um, protected a pretty narrow set of liberties, allowed for a lot of power on the part of the government. Rehnquist is an older version, um, a mid 20th century version um, of what conservative uh, jurists were like relative to uh, the First Amendment. Um, that's water under the bridge relative to the Roberts Court. These are the justices of the Roberts Court, conservative and liberals alike, are all children of the Warren Court. Um, and so they've taken on board uh, the much more expansive, much more libertarian vision um, of the Warren Court uh, when it comes at least uh, to thinking about um, uh, free speech. Um, and so what the Roberts Court is doing then is not um, rolling back uh, the kind of civil libertarian revolution that occurs in the mid part of the 20th century uh, relative to uh, freedom of speech. Instead, they're consolidating uh, the legacy of uh, that revolution and then trying to build on it and extend it um, into the future. Um, so as I said, notably, even the conservatives are free speech libertarians. All this is where uh, Alito comes in. We'll say a bit about that in a minute. Um, and interestingly, the court has been fairly busy in talking about First Amendment issues, um, but not in big sweeping ways. Um, uh, they aren't issuing the kind of giant landmarks that have uh, big ramifications that are relatively easy uh, to see what the headline is. 
Um, instead, it's a lot of stuff in the weeds, uh, much more complicated doctrine, uh, making much more sort of small scale, detailed kinds of decisions in particular technical areas um, of the First Amendment um, in general. And the Roberts Court is fairly unified on this. And so for a lot of these uh, cases, um, uh, there are big majorities uh, for the most part. Sometimes you get some dissents. There are some places we'll talk about uh, where there's particular divisions on the court. There's a lot of uni unity and agreement um, across the board um, on the Roberts Court when it comes to free speech issues. And one of the significant features of uh, this kind of libertarian aspect uh, to uh, the Roberts Court is that they have very much resisted the invitation uh, to carve out new exceptions um, to the scope of free speech. Um, so as we uh, look back on Whitney versus California, for example, right, where we say, uh, well, you know, the free speech right is not going to be absolute. There are going to be some restrictions. They're going to be necessary um, by its nature. Um, there's a set of sort of qualifications and, and carve outs um, uh, to freedom of speech um, they get elaborated in the early and mid uh, 20th century. Um, uh, there's continued pressure um, on the part of elected politicians to say, uh, let's carve out some new exceptions, some additional exceptions um, uh, to the First Amendment. Um, and the Roberts Court has been pretty emphatic in saying, no, no new exceptions. We're not carving out any new um, spaces um, in the First Amendment. The kinds of exceptions and qualifications and restrictions on freedom of speech um, that we inherited from the mid 20th century, um, those are going to still be in place and we're not going to add uh, more. Um, and so we see this in a variety of places, both coming from state governments and also from Congress that sort of is pushing on uh, the scope of these free speech protections. So United States versus Stevens um, is a so-called uh, crush video, um, animal crush video cases. These are depictions of animal cruelty uh, that are then um, uh, being sold on the commercial market. Uh, the government tries to, uh, in this case, Congress tries to regulate and, and restrict that, argues in defense of that. Uh, we need a new exception uh, to the First Amendment that allows for this. The Roberts Court says no way. Snyder v. Phelps uh, involves the Westboro Baptist Church and their um, uh, protest at funerals, um, uh, particularly of uh, veterans um, uh, that are quite um, uh, aggressive and offensive um, uh, to many. The government tries to specifically regulate um, uh, the ability of people to, pro to engage in these kind of political protests at uh, the funerals of private individuals. Um, the court, again, says, nope, you can't uh, carve out an exception for that. Uh, Brown Entertainment, uh, Brown versus um, Entertainment Merchant Association is an effort to regulate uh, video games, violent video games, in particular, um, uh, the accessibility of those video games to uh, minors. Um, the court likewise says no on that. Uh, United States versus Alvarez, this is so-called stolen valor case uh, where Congress tries to uh, criminalize people claiming they have uh, military uh, awards that they do not um, actually have. Um, uh, someone more broadly might think of this as an effort to regulate, it's, it's, it's the effort to regulate a specific kind of false speech, um, but it has implications for thinking about what kind of power the government might have to regulate uh, misinformation and false speech um, in a variety of contexts. Roberts Court, when confronted with it in this context, says no, no general exception uh, for false speech, that even false speech is protected by uh, the First Amendment. So this is where I will note that um, Justice Alito, um, interestingly, um, uh, uh, dissents from a lot of those kinds of moves that the court is making. So Alito um, has much more of the older style conservative in him. He's, he's probably the least uh, civil libertarian when it comes to uh, free speech provisions on the court. Um, but notably, he is still very civil libertarian. And so despite the fact he is probably the least civil libertarian uh, speech guy on the current court, uh, he's still far more civil libertarian than uh, what would have been true of a lot of earlier justices um, across the board, especially the earlier conservative um, justices. And so when Alito um, uh, sometimes departs from his uh, colleagues and being willing to uphold some of exercises of these government powers in these contexts. Um, he does so um, likewise by trying to carve out um, uh, very uh, contextual, fact-specific uh, distinctions and not just sort of say, okay, let's whole hog, carve out some big new exceptions to the First Amendment. Let's make these arguments. The First Amendment just doesn't apply here. Um, instead, he wants to say, okay, we have to think very specifically about this very specific situation. Maybe there's a wrinkle here. Um, and so interestingly, even when Alito dissents, 
he's not really taking the strong form of the dissent and saying, yeah, the First Amendment just doesn't apply here. Instead, he wants to say, let's carve out something very specific. And so each one of those cases I mentioned before, you see Alito trying to say, no, there's more space here for the government uh, than the Supreme Court majority tends to want to say. So he thinks Stevens can be narrowed. Uh, we can narrow the statute and how we think about it because there's a subset of um, content that the statute is trying to regulate uh, that Congress does have the authority um, uh, to regulate. And he thinks that so we just understood the statute to only be capturing that. Uh, we could just leave it um, alone. Um, notably, uh, Congress, in response to the Stevens case, goes back and drafts a statute that looks much more like what Alito had suggested. Um, we, the court ought to interpret the statute to me in the first place, um, and the courts have left it alone. So Congress sort of has put in place something that looks like what Alito said uh, would be constitutionally uh, valid. Alito just would have said, we don't have to actually force Congress to, re to write a whole new statute. We could just understand the old statute to having this sort of limited um, uh, implication. Likewise, in these other cases, Alito wants to emphasize, look, there's a narrow, there's a way of understanding this conflict as being fairly narrow, fairly circumscribed, and there's more space here for the government to take action uh, than might otherwise be the case. But even if we take Alito as being sort of the least civil libertarian on the speech stuff um, on the current court more generally, as I say, he's still pretty uh, libertarian on these things. Um, and this is reflected in this case of Mattel versus Tam, which is a case involving uh, Trademark Act um, uh, from Congress uh, in which Congress had said um, that you can't trademark um, uh, certain kinds of offensive uh, um, uh, trademarks in general, the government can't um, uh, designate those as being uh, trademark worthy. Because this gets challenged, and Alito writes the opinion uh, for the court here in which he invokes uh, some of the most civil libertarian cases uh, from across the 20th century uh, in order to emphasize why it is the government can't carve out this exception for offensive uh, trademarks. Um, so as Alito says in this particular quote, um, uh, that even the speech we hate, including speech that demeans people on the basis of race or gender or religion or other uh, kinds of grounds, so-called hate speech uh, generally, uh, that's still protected by the First Amendment. And as a consequence, uh, Congress can't, reg can't regulate or prohibit it in this trademark context, but also in lots of, of other kinds of context as well. Um, so uh, Lito is perfectly happy to um, call back to um, what were once viewed as very liberal uh, Supreme Court um, decisions um, that he thinks is nonetheless fully, he's fully on board with, um, even as a relative uh, conservative. So, um, finally, let's just say a little bit about um, some other areas of law. So these are more specific, less about sort of broad patterns from the Roberts Court. Um, uh, we're trying to think about some specific areas, including uh, particularly um, areas relating to uh, school and educational uh, context, um, which uh, I suspect we're going to get some more doctrine on uh, in the not too uh, distant uh, future and uh, it remains to be seen sort of where the court's likely to land um, on some of that. Um, so there's a couple of elements of it that are worth um, uh, taking note of. Uh, one is thinking about a government employee speech more generally. That is to say, what speech rights um, uh, do government employees, qual government employees uh, have? And the particular concern here is not the usual concern in a First Amendment context where the government, as the government is trying to regulate speech, but instead the government uh, might be trying to regulate speech as your employer. Um, so in the employer-employee relationship that the government's entered into, what kind of control do they have or their own employees speaking, not what kind of role do they have in regulating citizens more generally? And the court has struggled some. We're trying to think about um, how should we think about this kind of government employee speech? Um, uh, this gets set up from a 1969 case uh, um, known as Pickering, which involved a school teacher who wrote a letter to a, a newspaper um, about um, school policy um, and was fired for it. Um, and the court then said, no, no, even though he's a school teacher, he has First Amendment rights relative to writing a, a letter to the editor of a newspaper and talking about matters of public concern more generally. You can't just fire him uh, for engaging in that kind of uh, generally protected speech as long as it's not particularly disruptive um, to uh, his job, and he's still capable of doing his job, and it's not particularly disruptive to the workplace. So the court has struggled more recently in trying to think about, okay, what are the implications of that kind of rule? Um, and significantly, in the Garcetti case um, in 2006, 
uh, the court was confronted with an assistant district attorney who wrote a memo uh, that his supervisor um, did not like and wanted to uh, sanction him uh, for um, uh, how he wrote the memo. And, and the argument of the assistant district attorney is, well, look, the content of the memo that I was writing in the workplace dealt with matters of public concern, just like Pickering's uh, letter to the newspaper did. And so I ought to be protected and not be, and, and, and my supervisor shouldn't be able to sanction me for talking about matters of public concern in my uh, legal memos. And the court in that context says, look, there's a big difference between writing memos as part of your job and writing letters to the newspaper. Um, and when you are performing your job functions, um, uh, the government as an employer um, can definitely uh, discipline and sanction you um, in various ways for um, how you are performing your job. Um, this nonetheless created a 5-4 split um, on the court that carves out um, this particular space and how they think about government employee speech that when you're engaged in speech pursuant to their duties, um, uh, your rights are fairly limited. Um, this obviously has uh, immediate implications for thinking about uh, the rights of school teachers um, in the classroom. Um, in the K through 12 um, public uh, school uh, context, it potentially has implications for um, state university professors um, as well, um, which I think are potentially different. So the K through 12 context in particular is a fair amount of, uh, of uh, judicial doctrine, both from the US Supreme Court, but especially in the lower courts, um, suggesting that K through 12 teachers are similarly situated to how the assistant district attorney was situated here. That is when they're speaking in the classroom, performing their duties, um, the government as an employer um, has a great deal of interest in what they say in that classroom context and can restrict what they say um, in that cl classroom context because at the end of the day, the teachers are supposed to be conveying the government's message um, uh, through their classroom behavior. Um, the court in Garcetti specifically carves out uh, potential effects on uh, state university professors um, and says, uh, maybe they're different and we'll deal with that down the road. Um, uh, so they don't say one way or another exactly what the deal is uh, with uh, state uh, university professors. Um, they at least recognize this is a potential complication because we treat them the same way here um, as we're treating the assistant district attorney. Um, it has big implications for how we think of academic freedom uh, in a university context. Um, and this is what I expect we'll soon see uh, more uh, core opinions uh, relating to, uh, to thinking about uh, what kinds of First Amendment rights uh, do K through 12 teachers have um, and what kind of First Amendment rights uh, do uh, state university professors have uh, relative to their classroom uh, speech in general. In addition, we have um, a student speech context, um, which we may get more of, although I think that's less immediately um, implicated at the, at the present moment, but these things continue to come up. Um, so this also dates from about the same time as the Pickering case the, involving the school teacher writing the letter to the newspaper, Tinker versus Des Moines School District. Um, involves um, students wearing uh, black armbands to protest the Vietnam War. Uh, to school. Um, here, the court likewise says, look, even school children uh, in a school context have some First Amendment rights. Again, the emphasis is they can't be disruptive to the school environment um, when they do it, but, th but they don't leave uh, their First Amendment rights at home, uh, even though they're children, even though they're in a school environment, there's some First Amendment issues um, at stake here. Leaves it very open as try to think about, okay, well, how do we balance these interests of First Amendment principles uh, for students uh, in a school context with um, the educational function of schools, the discipline necessary to maintain schools, et cetera. And the court occasionally has revisited this um, on occasion. And when they do, they tend to restrict a little bit um, uh, uh, what the scope of student speech rights might be. Um, so Morse versus Frederick, uh, the so-called uh, bong hits for Jesus uh, case uh, from 2007 involves um, students at a, a school event. Uh, they go outside and uh, that includes the students who unfurl a banner um, uh, that says bong hits for Jesus. No one quite clear what that might mean, uh, but nonetheless, the school doesn't like it. Um, uh, thinks it's a pro-drug uh, message, which at least is plausible. Um, and the school wants to punish the students for um, having this pro-drug message um, as school-related uh, event. The court, again, uh, divides about how to uh, think about this. Um, but the court emphasizes that, look, in, in this context where it's a school activity, um, the school was putting you out there, in this case, on the street to watch the Olympic torch uh, run by. 
Um, that's a school activity, and in a school activity, uh, the uh, school can reasonably restrict uh, what kinds of speech uh, the students engage in, um, including unfurling, uh, including what the content of banners they might unfurl um, in that might uh, look like. By contrast, we've also more recently got the um, profane cheerleader case, um, uh, which involves a cheerleader who is unhappy uh, with the cheer squad, took to social media to express her unhappiness uh, in uh, various profane uh, ways. Uh, the school didn't appreciate um, uh, the, this message being directed um, about their um, uh, cheer squad um, and wanted to uh, sanction her for it. Um, but the U.S. Supreme Court overwhelmingly um, accepts the students' free speech rights um, in this context. So it has a very interesting sort of bright line the court wants to draw between the kind of situation in Morse v. Frederick, which is to say um, these are school-related activities. And in that context, when you're engaged in educational activities, school-sponsored activities, the school has some interest in regulating it, as opposed to you're completely off campus doing your own thing on your own time, but the school becomes aware of it, especially in the context of social media, the mere fact the school becomes aware of it, the mere, mere fact that you might think there's some spillover effects from the stuff you say outside uh, for what's happening in the school, um, there's uh, robust First Amendment protections for students um, in that in that context. The school can't just go out um, and uh, regulate everything students say uh, when the students are off um, on their own time. Um, and that kind of uh, bright line rule has become particularly important in the age of social media where uh, school is much more aware um, of what people might be saying um, on their um, own time. And finally, let me end by um, talking a little bit about government um, speech in general, in particular because the government speech uh, links up neatly to um, uh, some of these government employee speech kind of concerns and some of the educational speech context, um, and because government speech has been something the court likewise been struggling with lately, um, and has issued some important decisions about um, of late and trying to think about. It. So, government speech in general is to say um, the speech that the government itself engages in. And so the court's basic orientation to that kind of speech from a First Amendment context is say, there are no First Amendment constraints on the government conveying its own message. The government can say whatever it wants um, in its own voice. The challenge um, that arises persistently in these cases is say, well, when do we know that it's the government speaking as opposed to a private individual speaking? Um, and so you see the kinds of examples that have come up for the court in which they potentially are blurring the distinction um, about um, is this the government talking or is this some private individual talking? Um, so Pleasant Grove uh, City uh, involved uh, park monuments um, uh, that were put by private individuals um, in the park. And so is that an example of governmental speech um, or is it an example of private speech? And so can government choose uh, what kinds of monuments are going to be shown and restrict it and throw out some monuments because they don't like the message? Um, or is that protected because of the private individual talking? Um, and in that context, the, the court says, no, no, monuments in a public park um, are governmental speech, um, and the government then can control what kind of speech they want um, in that context. By contrast, Walker versus Son of Confederate Veterans involve uh, personal license plates, especially license plates, uh, in which people are um, asking the government to put their message um, on the license plate, again, raising questions about well, is the message that the driver asked the government to print on its license plate count as government speech, in which case the government can refuse to print some kinds of messages, or is this private speech, in which case the government should not restrict uh, what kinds of messages um, uh, you're allowed to convey in this context? And then just in the last term, we have uh, this case coming out of Boston involving uh, flagpoles in which the city allowed uh, various flags to be raised. And the question is, well, are all those flags being raised by the city um, governmental speech, in which case the government, the city can pick and choose which flags it wants to raise, um, or is it um, uh, private speech, um, in which case the government um, the hands are more tied about which kinds of flags get raised up the flagpole um, in this context. And again, there's this sort of uh, coming down this in this case of saying uh, the flagpole um, uh, flag raising is is not governmental speech um, uh, per se. But the court has really struggled with that kind of problem of um, you have speech that's occurring on government property or through government property in some form, um, and it sometimes is murky as to whether this is the government speaking in that context, in which case the government has a lot of control um, over that speech. 
um, or is it a private individual who happens to be using or occupying uh, some public uh, land or space in some fashion, um, but it, but because it's a private individual conveying the message, uh, the government's hands um, are more tied um, in that context. Um, and that's particularly important, I think, in part because it does gonna, it's going to also have implications for thinking about um, some of the educational speech uh, con context. And so, if we think, for example, about the bill that's now sitting in the Florida legislature, embodying some of Ron DeSantis's uh, proposals for uh, regulating um, higher education, uh, in particular, <clears throat> one of the provision of that bill um, is to say. Uh, that a new requirement for students um, who are taking, who are uh, going to uh, state universities in the state of Florida, is they all have to take a, a class um, that um, uh, uh, inculcates uh, values consistent with maintaining a republican form of government. Um, so it's not only requiring that a particular class be taken by students um, who are going through state schools, but also conveys what kind of message should that class um, uh, extend. Um, in the class. So it's really trying to regulate the kind of perspectives and viewpoints uh, that the class is supposed to uh, communicate. So it goes to this kind of question, okay, in that context with the professor who gets hired to have to teach that class, is that going to be an instance of government speech, in which case the government can tell the professor exactly what they want to be said in that context and can sanction the professor if they say the wrong stuff um, in that classroom context? Or should we think of a professor in a state university teaching a class as engaged in a kind of private speech um, that the government can't properly uh, control um, and regulate? So there's going to be some weird wrinkles um, that come up in the government speech context going forward that I think are going to have particular uh, implications for uh, speech regulation in classrooms and in, in and around the educational setting. Um, and clearly, we're busily um, fighting over um, that these days. And so I, I expect we'll get um, some new Supreme Court doctrine um, in the not too distant future, um, probably across a lot of these domains, but all relating to um, educational context um, of various sorts. Mm -hmm.